John Nunn and in this video I'm going to continue my trip down Gambit Publications memory lane talking about some of the books we've produced in the past and which are still available for sale today. In this video I'm going to talk about one of our first books, How to Beat Your Dad at Chess. It's a great title and it was our first ever venture into the scholastic market, published in 1998 and written by Grandmaster Mari Chandler. It is one of our absolute top selling titles. It's been um, a bestseller for over 20 years now and continues to do strongly today. At first sight it seems easy to produce a book for kids. You need some elementary positions and you just need to explain a bit and there you are, you've got a book. It doesn't even have to be very long. But actually, it's really hard to produce a good book for kids. Teaching is a demanding profession. You not only have to have an excellent grasp of your subject, you also have to be able to present it in an approachable way and to understand the level of your audience and not to be patronising or talk down to them. In chess terms, it's quite easy to get the level wrong. Chess authors, and I, I admit to having done this myself from time to time, tend to be rather self-indulgent. They write about what they're interested in and not what their audience is interested in. And so it's easy for a grandmaster author to just um, write over the heads of the target audience and produce something which isn't of great value, or at least isn't of value to the people who are uh, intending to buy it. But with How to Beat Your Dad at Chess, uh, I think the author got it pretty much spot on. Since then we've produced a number of other kids' books, all of which have been fairly successful, but none of them have reached the, uh, the level of the, the very first uh, book in the series. When we started out on this book, we had quite a detailed thought about how it should look and we had a designer, David Stanley, who produced this cover design, and here it is. And when we saw these kind of rather basic drawings on the front, we thought, hmm, not too sure about that. And then we showed it around in the book trade, and there was quite a bit of a shaking of heads. But we decided to go with uh, David's design after all, and over 100,000 sales later, I think nobody at Gambit is regretting that decision. Internally, the layout is uh, very modular. The basic theme of the book is the 50 deadly checkmates, which are 50 common mating patterns which occur in over-the-board play. Each of the 50 has a double-page spread, uh, usually, usually presenting the basic idea and then a series of over the board examples. And then at the end of the book, there's a section of exercises where readers can test their knowledge. Although it's theoretically a kid's book, a number of adults, whom I will not name, have said that they have found the book very helpful as well. So anyhow, let's take a look at one of the 50 sections and see, um, well, get a typical idea of the contents of the book. So Deadly Checkmate 3, is the Arabian mate, which is a mate with Rook and Knight. It's called the Arabian mate because it is thought to be one of the oldest mating positions on record. Over the centuries, the moves of some of the chess pieces have changed, mainly to increase their power, but the moves of Rook and Knight have remained basically unchanged for several hundred years. So this mating pattern goes back to the days when Arab countries were the leading chess nations, and that's why it has the name. Well, let's take a look, and we can see how the mate works. The rook swings across and traps the black king in the corner with the aid of a knight. The key element here is the knight on f6, or of course on on some of the other squares of the white knight on c6, black knights on c3 or f3 are symmetrical and basically the same. It doesn't only work when the black king's in the corner. There are 
variations on it, which in some ways um, are more common in practice. In this version, the knight on f6 remains the same. Rook is on the back rank and the black king is not in the corner. But the mating pattern, the relative positions of knight and rook, are the same. So we say this is part of the same general structure. Here the black pawn on f7 takes away a potential flight square from the king and the white pawn cooperates with the other pieces to cover the remaining squares. So once again, it's mate. So the section continues with three practical examples. It's white to play. Uh, white faces quite nasty threats. The black's threatening mate in one, in fact, with queen takes rook. And king takes rook doesn't really help because of queen takes rook check. So white has to do something drastic. In fact, because of the strength of black threats, all the moves have to be with check. So white starts by sacrificing his queen. Black must take, it's the only legal move. And then the white rook swings to the back rank, delivering check. Again, black has only one move. And now we have the pattern of the Arabian mate, the second of the basic positions we saw at the beginning of the section. Here the, it's a black knight rather than a black pawn, which takes away the flight square from the king. But the positions of pawn, knight and rook are the same. So we get the same mate that we saw earlier. As is typical in this book, we then get a position which is slightly more complicated and requires a um, more difficult preliminary move. Here we have black with the structure of pawn supporting knight. At the moment the rook can't swing onto the back rank for the mating pattern because that square is covered by the white rook from a1. The first move is the rather surprising queen sacrifice, giving up the queen for the rook. And then the rook sweeps in, threatening the standard mate. Here white has a queen, and white in fact can give checks here or here, but it doesn't make any difference. For example, after this check, black just moves his king, and a further check here is impossible because this square is covered by the black knight. So if we go back to the position after black plays his rook to d1, the only way that white is able to prevent mate is by giving up his queen, for example, like this. That's a check, so white has to move his king, and then black grabs the knight, the rook comes back to b1 to round up the past b pawn, and then black wins easily with his extra material. Of course, you might say it's supposed to be a deadly checkmate, and actually in this variation it's not a checkmate, black wins on material. But um, that reflects the way things work in real life. A lot of mates can be averted by jettisoning a suitably large amount of material, but in most cases it doesn't change the result of the game. And it's the mating threat which is the deciding factor. If we go on to the third position, well this is a bit more difficult still. And you might like to have a think about this yourself before I show you the solution. So I'm going to pause for a few seconds so you can stop the video and think about the position before I um, explain what happens. Okay, well the pawn and the knight are in the standard position but at the moment the check on the back rank doesn't get white anywhere because the black king can move to e7 rather than to g7 and now although white has a variety of checks they don't lead to mate so that doesn't actually get white very far and white is indeed a pawn down in the initial position so if he wants to win he has to do something special the correct move is actually to move the rook back attacking the bishop the idea is that the rook is going to go to e1 and then to e8 giving a check from a square which doesn't allow the black king to slip away as happened after the immediate check on c8. So white's gaining a tempo by attacking the bishop to bring his rook to the better square, e1. Well, black can try to block the e-file to prevent the white rook switch, but then white goes back to plan a and gives this check, king must still go to e7, and then this check, and now there's a skewer along the e-file. 
king has to move to d6 and then white simply locks off the black bishop winning a piece and the game so black after white's first move black can't just block the e file so let's suppose he plays his bishop to a6 there in fact aren't very many squares the bishop can go to then white puts his rook on e1 there's a threat to deliver mate in two with rook check and then rook to g8 mate with the pattern we saw earlier and there's no way that black can prevent the check on e8 he can't block the e-file he can't cover e8 the black rook is very badly placed it can't come back to the first rank to prevent the white rook check and the bishop can't come to b5 because that square is defended by the white pawn as in the previous case black can prevent the mate by simply giving his rook up for nothing but the result of the game will be the same well that's what it says um, in the main part of the book but as I mentioned there are some test positions at the end of the book and you might like to think about this one it's white to play and white again has this pawn and knight combination but at the moment the black rook on the back rank prevents the standard mate so have a think about this and see if you can find out how white wins okay let's take a look um, I'm going to click on the link so that we can see the solution well the black rook prevents the, the immediate mate and simply swapping rooks doesn't help because again black rook prevents the white rook going to the 8th rank for the usual Arabian mate pattern so the correct solution is the slightly unexpected doubling of the white rooks on the 8th rank normally when you double rooks the rooks defend each other and this is a slightly unusual case in that the black rook lies in between the two white rooks but the black rook is doubly attacked so there's not a big choice for black here he has to take one rook or the other or he's just going to lose a rook so let's suppose he takes this rook white takes back and now there's no way to prevent the rook coming to g8 with mate in this case black can't even prevent the mate by giving up material because giving up the rook actually only delays the mate by one move so that's a good idea of the structure of the book there are 49 other mating patterns covered in the book and a set of exercises um, as I say it's been one of our best sellers for um, more than 20 years and all those people who bought it can't really be wrong so I'm happy that you uh, watched this video and I look forward to seeing you for the next one